Hello, Curious Minds, and welcome to another episode of the Heas Podcast. I'm your host, Victoria, and I'm happy to be back with yet another episode on human evolution, archaeology, and ancient genomics. This episode will be a little different than the ones you're used to. This one will be a standalone featuring a really special guest. I'm excited to present you one of my now role models, Tracy Kivel. Tracy is the director of the Human Origins Department at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig. She is a paleoanthropologist focusing on the evolution of the skeleton in living and fossil primates, including our human ancestors. I could not cut this conversation any shorter than it is right now because I can't rob you of this experience. Tracy and I really had an engaging and interesting and motivational chat all in one, and we really had a lot of fun recording this for you. So let me tell you what you can expect from this conversation. First of all, you're going to learn a lot about the evolution of the human hand and what's so special about it, setting us apart from our ancestors. Then we're moving on to talking about how an academic career is compatible with the private life, if even, and how the proportion of women in academia drops significantly after reaching a certain age. I'm also asking Tracy about the female role model seminar she's going to give at her faculty. And then we're moving back to the origins of bipedalism and other sciencey things. This conversation with Tracy really changed the mood of my whole week and probably also the trajectory and point of view that I'll move forward in science with. And that was living proof to me that a small conversation can really do a lot and change a lot for one. And that many factors contribute to being a good scientist. It's much more than efficiency and overworking, putting your blinders on and running over people. Actually, these behavioral patterns might not get you to the place you want to be, career-wise, but also in your private life. And that's just one of my take-home messages from this interview. So, my dear listeners, enjoy the wisdom and stories Tracy has to share with us. And as always, stay curious, stay engaged, and welcome to the Hey Us Podcast. Tracy, welcome to the Heas Podcast. Who are you and what's your job? Well, thank you for having me, Victoria. I'm uh, Tracy Kivel, and I am the director of the Department of Human Origins at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig. Well, that is amazing. First of all, congratulations. I read that you became the director in 2023, so not that long of a time mm -hmm. ago. And... What's that like and what are your main goals for this new institute, for this department? Oh, good questions. <laughs> so um, it's, it's an amazing job that I feel very privileged to, to have. Um, it's, yeah, it's, I, I was a postdoc in the previous Department of Human Evolution. So there's still times where I pinch myself and think, I remember as a postdoc thinking, in with when Jean-Jacques Hublin was the director and thinking, oh, I'd never want that job. <laughs> it looks so complicated <laughs> and so stressful. And he had so many dinners to go to and things like this. Um, and um, but now here I am and I, I have that job. Um, and so it's it's uh, it's stressful and it's um, amazing. And Uh, I'm really, really happy. So I have to say, so the department has a, a different focus than the previous Department of, of Human Evolution. So it's now the Department of Human Origins, which reflects um, a focus on sort of earlier time periods in, in hominin evolution. So trying to sort of uh, fill the gaps in our understanding of 
uh, early Austropis and early Homo and even moving even into the late Miocene where we can better understand like sort of uh, fossil apes and importantly something about African ape evolution which we basically know nothing about because we have very very few fossils of African apes. Could you give us a little time frame, an idea of when the late Miocene happened? When was that? Yeah, so the Miocene is a time period between roughly 25,000 and 5 million years ago. That's divided into early, middle and late Miocene. I'd say what's interesting about the Miocene is it was the the land of apes rather than the land of monkeys. So now that today we have way more species of monkeys than we do of apes, in the Miocene it was the opposite. We had hundreds of different species of, of apes and very few monkeys until we get to this late Miocene period. Um, and so in the late Miocene we have these uh, many different types of hominoids or apes that have morphology that looks a little bit like a chimp or looks a bit like a gorilla or an orangutan but then it has p part of its post cranial skeleton looks like something we've never seen before and so there's lots of really interesting diversity in this late miocene period which let's say between sort of um 10 and 5 million years ago is um some really interesting apes that um show us the diversity of the ways that apes could have moved and interacted in their environments. But, um, and there are some really nice fossils that are some that are fairly complete, but, and then others that are really patchy. So it's, a there are lots of species that we only know from like a couple of teeth, for example. So we have really no idea what the rest of their body looks like. So it's a really interesting yeah. time period. And one that I think helps us to understand what that last common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees and bonobos might have looked like. So we can address that question sort of from the the bottom up as well as from the top down, if mm. that makes sense. So looking from the fossils to reconstruct from before and then also looking at living apes today and trying to figure right. out, you know, what we all have in common that helps us to understand, reconstruct that last common ancestor. So the picture is far from being complete. As you mentioned, the fossil record is quite sparse. Mm -hmm. So I like the idea of also tackling it from the side of looking at current species and great apes and then comparing the differences or like what we have in common. So one of your research focuses is the evolution of the human hand. Can you tell us what's so particularly special about the human hand compared to other hominins and also great apes? Yes, yeah, so I think, so if we go back to, I'd say 20 years ago, what we thought was like special about the human hand and um, is, well, and I think it, which is still true today, we, our hands are really amazing in terms of their manipulative abilities or our dexterity. Um, and so in many ways, our, our ha human hands are really cool. And why I love them is because the morphology in many ways is really primitive um, that we have, you know, we still have five digits just like, um, you know, all primates do. And many, you know, compared to let's say a whale or a bat or a horse where they've lost digits or their digits have been turned into wings or fins, right? So they're, they're primitive in that, in that respect, but the function of our hands is really derived. So we have this ability to, um, use forceful precision grips. Um, so that means the way we bring our thumbs or, or the pad of our thumb towards the pads of our digits. Could you show to the camera what you're doing with the, with the yeah. thumb? Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's the, that grip. And the pad bit so is um, actually really important because a chimp can do this. So we what we would call sort of tip to tip mm -hmm. um, precision. Um, and they so they can bring the tip of their finger to the tip of their thumb, but they can't do pad to pad. And that's because their fingers are too long to reach all the way down to their short thumbs. Yeah. And so it's this pad to pad bit that allows us to grasp things really forcefully. It allows us to um, grasp things carefully. Like if you think, you know, uh, something that's really fragile or, you know, so you have a lot more dexterity and manipulative ability with um being able to use this sort of pad to pad kind of precision that is 
typically thought not to be possible for、um, apes, but it now、uh, monkeys can do this. I think so. The more we look at monkeys in the wild, and particularly ones that use、uh, that can, can use tools like macaques or、mm-hmm. capuchin monkeys, or even baboons that eat a lot of grasses, for example, they can do this in part because they have longer thumbs and shorter fingers compared to. Chimpanzees. That's、yeah. interesting.、Mm-hmm. I, I didn't know that. I know that chimpanzees,、uh, in comparison to us, are not able to、um, have like these complex movements and manipulating stuff. You know,、mm-hmm. but I didn't know. I wasn't aware that monkeys could like also have this. What, what do you call that again? Perci- forceful precision grip. Forceful <laughs> precision grip. Yeah. Okay. I'll try to remember that. Yeah. But maybe if I can clarify one point, so of course. I guess so. The forceful bit is the important one. Is so. So that's also something. The forcefulness is something that is thought also to be unique to humans, and. And the tricky part is that's hard to measure in other primates. Is you know, like it's hard to get a a chimpanzee to to squeeze a little force transducer without destroying it at the same time. And the same thing with like with a monkey, for example. So it's so it, whether they can do it forcefully or not, I think is something we just we requires further investigation. I think we don't quite know that. So I think there's things that we think are unique to humans, and certainly our dexterity. Is like we can, you know, we can do things with our hands、yeah. that a chimpanzee or a macaque cannot do.、Um, but what exactly is distinct about humans, I think, requires、um, a little bit more investigation. The more we look at living primates, I think, the less we figure out is actually unique to humans. And as you mentioned in your talk, which I really liked, by the way, thank you. <laughs> it's easier to get humans to do a certain task and then measure. The pressure also applied by, by their thumbs,、mm-hmm. then to tell a chimp or even a monkey, okay, now let's sit down and do this. So the absence of、um, the evidence doesn't mean that necessarily it's you know not there just because because you cannot measure it. Yes. So that's、yeah. hard. Science、yes. is difficult. <laughs> It is, but you know, this means there's lots of unanswered questions. This means we still have a lot of jobs to do. <laughs> exactly, there's、yeah. still plenty of of work to be done、exactly. by your department, and I'm excited to see the papers coming out and follow up on that. Thank you. So, is there a special research project、um, that is outstanding to you and that you like to chat about? Oh, maybe something coming up, something exciting. Oh boy, what is? <laughs> I have to think about what. So,、um, what I've been working on recently, and as I said in my talk, I find the, the the sort of the further I sort of progress in my career, the less research I actually do. <laughs> so,、um, because it's your team that then does、yeah. it, and the team that has the skills to to apply these new methods and stuff.、Um, but we have been. So as I talked about in my talk, it was、um, a focus on Australopithecus sediba and Homo naledi, but we are looking at also the hand bones of、uh, Homo habilis.、Uh, so、uh, Homo habilis is a, is a really interesting, I think, a really interesting species because it's the earliest species of of our own genus and the OH seven fossil. So that's the the type specimen of Homo habilis were found in the. Early 1960s, and there's hand and mandible and,、uh, or sorry, and a jawbone and part of a cranium that are all part of this Homo habilis type specimen. And Homo habilis is called Homo habilis because it means handyman, and it's because those hand bones were sort of interpreted as being hands that were capable of tool use and potentially precision grips. Maybe not as good as as humans, but Um, and that they were associated these hand bones with foss or sorry with an, with、um, old one tools that were found at sort of the same level、mm-hmm. at the at Old Vai Gorge in Tanzania and so these these hand fossils have been around for many decades now、um, and but they haven't really been the internal bone structure hasn't been studied、um, in them yet and so that's what we're working on now and. Unfortunately, I wish there was more of it preserved than there actually is. But, <laughs> but what we're finding is it, it is showing a pattern that is different than what we see in Australopithecus sediba, which is, you know, roughly around the same time period. So, well, 
in geological terms, so <laughs> Sediba is around 2 million years old. The OH7 fossils are around 1.8 million. Um, so 200,000 years, yes, is a, is a large chunk of time, but in an hominin fossil record, essentially contemporaneous <laughs> in some ways. And um, so they're doing something different than Sediba. And, uh, and also, which suggests that if they are the maker of those tools, uh, then they're doing it in a different in a different way than other hominins were at the same time, which I think is which is which is fun, fun to think about. Yeah, no, it is crazy to think about that. At some point, we were not the only ones, or not even existent at this point, and there were so many different species that had their own way of like living, subsistence, and tool making or handling. So, what? Why do you think? were the only species that made it out of there <laughs> that's still present <laughs> that's a great question oh um well it's that, that made it out of africa or do you mean like or or do you mean just the ones like that, that made humans, it that make it that we're the only that species it, around. Yeah, or that's still yeah. present yeah um th this is a really good question and because i think so I'm, I really like this older time periods, right? Sort of this 3 million, 4 million, 5 million. I think there's lots of interesting questions there. However, I also think fossils like Homo floresiensis, that is around 100,000 years old, Homo naledi, that is, let's say, around 300,000 years old, some really quite recent, that is living at the same time as Neanderthals, at the same time as Homo erectus, at the same time as the earliest species of us, I think... This is fascinating to think yeah. there's at least five different species of hominins around the same time period that all looked quite different in terms of brain size, in terms of body size, in terms of their technology. Um, what made humans in particular special and, and allowed them to I don't, I, yeah, I don't know. I didn't mean, <laughs> I know it's a tough question, a tough but I had to go with it. Because, yes. I mean, I have an expert sitting right here and I would also like your opinion. Yeah. We don't have all the facts. So there is some room for speculation, but as you know so much, I thought I would just go with it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the, so I, I think there's some interesting, you know, I think we can sort of safely say like Homo floresiensis, for example. Um, and, you know, is this small brained, weird, wonderful thing <laughs> living on, on an island. And so I can see, okay, it's isolated and you can see, okay, it's not, it's not in a environmental or ecological context that isn't going to allow it to sort of take over the world. Um, the more interesting question, which is, you know, which is why people at this institute are going to answer way better than I can, is why humans over Neanderthals, given that they had essentially the same brain essentially the same kind of body when we talk about in, in yeah. broader comparative sense and in many cases the same technologies um and so that is i think a, is a is a trickier one that also i think geneticists are going to be able to help us answer more than probably morphology and maybe archaeology can yeah probably a combination of both yeah. because everything yeah. has its own value but together i think We'll be able to uncover a lot of things in the future. Yes, I agree. Okay, so I saw you're also hosting the female role model seminar at our faculty. I think it is tomorrow, right? It is, yeah. Can you tell us a bit about that? <laughs> well, great question, because I have I thought about the talk I did this morning. <laughs> I haven't thought about so much about the talk I'm going to give tomorrow. Um, well... Yeah, I think there's sort of that, you know, you think of, it's sometimes you think, oh, am I a role model? <laughs> yeah, that's one yeah. one bit that you have to sort of think about. Um, and what is it that I can share that makes, um, that might be useful to other, in particular to other women, but, um, but people of any gender. Uh, and I think, so I plan to just to talk a little bit just about my timeline of, you know, how I got interested in human evolution, given that I started with it with a fine arts degree, to be honest, <laughs> in a completely Ooh. different discipline. Um, I have a very poor science background, to be honest. Um, but I just was taken away with 
you know, when the first time someone showed me casts of fossil hominins, I was like, what? These, these exist? Like, I hadn't learned anything about it before I, I entered university. Um, so I thought I would just talk about my timeline and the sort of the different career steps that I made and in some cases the fortuitous timing of things like getting an ERC grant um, was really helpful in order to negotiate a better position for myself, negotiate maternity leave, which I actually didn't have at the time <laughs> because I was working in the UK. Well, um, that's a big topic in academia, especially. Yes. And that's why you can see, uh, there was a study, uh, sorry. that No, go ahead. Yeah. I just remember that there was a, a study done, a statistical study at this university and they saw like at the age of around 30, I think it was in around 30 in women, that there was a drop mm -hmm. in female like um, positions. Mm -hmm. um, and of course that correlates with the maternity leave because around that time, it's more likely that women are getting pregnant and mm -hmm. want to have family. So mm -hmm. from there onwards, the proportion of female scientists working at this university dropped like significantly. Yes. I was really, I mean, you kind of know you're aware, but to see that like black and white on paper, I was like, no, we have to change something. Yes, we do. Yes. And things have, things have gotten better, um, but there's still a long, long, long way to go. Such a long way. Yes. yes. So yes. I think it's really important that you also take the time to do such a seminar here. I'm really, I, I love to talk about these things. I think it's important. I think it should be talked more about. And you definitely are a role model. <laughs> oh, thank you, Victoria. <laughs> and yeah. no, really, you should keep that in mind. And look at you now. You have this position. I'm so happy that, I mean, a woman is yeah. in that position right now. And I, I think we're slowly, but I hope, surely, I hope I do not regret saying this <laughs> in the future, but we're moving forward. Yes. Yes, I think we I think we are. Um, and one of the things actually I th thought about talking about tomorrow also is that I've worked in so I'm Canadian originally. So I've worked in Canada, the US, in Germany and in the UK. And there are differences in how being a woman in all of those different academic contexts and being a woman who has children. Um, yeah, what sort of support is available the way you are viewed there are yeah there are some um subtle and somewhat drastic differences between these countries i bet um, there are yes <laughs> exactly and so and and in some way like so germany i find to be uh interesting in the sense that well, or i can speak for the max punk society that is really trying to move forward with hiring more women directorships and women that are in senior roles and they do that very well mm -hmm. in terms of you know they have targets and they're trying to make them and they but it's still a conversation only between women and men and it's not about diversity in gen like in general and there are other you know it's not and so that's an interesting that's thing yeah. and so like germany's really progressive in some ways but then they're discussion about um, diversity is still just about getting more women and it's not about mm. well maybe get the the intersections of women or people who are non-binary or people who identify as lgbtq or people of different ethnic backgrounds like there's a whole there's so much more to diversity than just getting more women. Yeah, <laughs> Even though getting more women is really important. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, we have to start somewhere, but still, I mean, you're so right. We have to keep in mind that there is not just a this or that, but so much more to that and so much more diversity that we still have to incorporate and learn so much more about. Yes, because it okay, makes our science better. It, definitely. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's try to have a positive outlook on it. I... I I still like, I would like to believe in humanity and that we're trying. Yes, I think we are. Mm -hmm. Now let's move into uh, another segment that's our follow-up questions that mm -hmm. I collect via Instagram. And actually somebody wrote in and said, I wanted to sign up for the role mo female role model seminar, but I'm unfortunately not in Vienna this week. Mm -hmm. What am I missing? And can you provide me with a take home message, please? Oh, a take home message, boy. <laughs> I don't what, know. <laughs> what would you like uh, the people in the seminar to remember? 
Oh, I haven't, to be honest, I haven't thought about it this much. You know, I'm sorry. I didn't want to challenge you with that. But I'm personally um, so interested as well. I think uh, maybe the tech, maybe as you just said, there. I want, I hope the take home message is one that is generally positive, that we're moving in the right direction, at least. And we're having, there is more openness to have difficult conversations about topics that are not just, you know, about gender, but also about one that I feel also very passionately about, which is behavioral misconduct that happens a lot in our fields and the negative impact that that has, particularly also particularly on women tend to, um, more often and the ripple effects of those kinds of behaviors. But, um, but the fact that we can more openly talk about that, I think is a really positive thing. And that has changed massively just in the last, I'd say five years um, mm. with the start of like the Me Too movement and stuff like this, right? The Me Too movement, sorry, I didn't say that correctly. Um, and uh, so I think hopefully the take home message is we have a way to go, <laughs> but we're moving in the right direction. And I think the more voices we have in the room, um, more women in the room, but also, yeah, as we just talked about, more diversity in general, um, yeah. the the better we're going to solve these problems. Yeah. And that's why I like to always bring that up during mm. my podcast conversations. It's a science podcast, but I think that's part of it. That's like part of how we, how science is produced mm -hmm. and it's tough already. So yes. I will always speak about that. <laughs> Good. I will always yeah. speak about it as well. Because I think I love that. you're you're absolutely like it is a science podcast. So, but it, this is a critical component to to, to science. Is. No, I think it's um, it is about making better. It's about making sure our, our our science is as good as it possibly can be. And if it's just a bunch of European white older men thinking about these questions, is not going to be it's not going to be the best science that it can be. So this is why we need to have, you know, we need to talk talk about these issues and make sure we have more people in the room that think about things that come with different experiences and different perspectives. And that makes for better science. Amen. <laughs> Next follow up question. Mm -hmm. Was there a time where you have challenged the status quo of your field? Mm. The status so maybe can I say it's the status quo with a field or maybe a slightly smaller perspective in that um, so my PhD I focused on the development of response <laughs> very specific topic um, because I was interested in the origins of bipedalism and whether or not humans or bipedalism evolved or, uh, from a knuckle walking ancestor and when did that happen um, around, uh, based on the fossil evidence and genetic evidence, probably somewhere between five and seven million years ago, um, is when, yeah, when humans and chimpanzees and bonobos shared this common ancestor. But obviously when we look, when we look at the fossil record in any way, the closer we get to that point, the more, the more similar things look. <laughs> so, and the fewer fossils that we have. So it's really hard to sort of, um, at least with current fossil evidence, to sort of figure mm. out what that last common ancestor looked like. And so we do a lot of this comparative analyses of, of living apes compared to humans and what do we share and what is different. And the things that we share, we assume, you know, through the concept of parsimony or the most, the easiest explanation is that something that we both inherited from a common ancestor. Um, But because we don't really have any fossils from this time period, um, there's this idea, you know, human or chimpanzees and bonobos are our closest living relatives and they are knuckle walkers and as are gorillas. And so it made sense once we figured out in the late 1960s that, you know, that chimps and gorillas are, or sorry, chimps are more closely related to us than they are to gorillas, that actually, maybe we did evolve from a knuckle-walking ancestor. Um, and I was really interested in this question for my PhD. And the reason I was 
looking at um, the wrist bones is because there's some similarities between humans and African apes in um, the fact that we actually have eight wrist bones while most other primates have nine and that there were some features of the wrist that were thought to be knuckle walking adaptations that humans and, and chimps and bonobos share and my supervisor was um, David Begun at the University of Toronto and he was one of these big proponents of this knuckle walking ancestor. And so was I when I started. I was like, yes, you know, I'm going to use carpal bones to prove that we had a knuckle walking ancestor. And by the end of my PhD, I had come to the opposite conclusion that I thought actually knuckle walking has evolved um, separately in in the lineage to gorillas and, the, and in the lineage to chimps and bonobos and that humans maybe evolve or bipedalism evolved from a more arboreal ancestor. And to the credit of my supervisor, David, he, he let me stand up there and defend in front of him, you know, you're wrong, <laughs> David. And, and, uh, and I've, I've always appreciated that about him. Um, I think it's the right thing to do, but it doesn't always happen with your That's PhD so supervisor. Um, and so, yeah, so I think that was, it was, I, I think looking back on it, thinking, wow, I can't, I, as a PhD student, I'm, I now think, wow, I just stood up there and said the exact opposite of what my supervisor <laughs> probably wanted me to say. Um, and so, yeah, that was, it was... What a boss move. <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> no. Also from his side, you know, to let yes. you stand up there. I think that's like a trait of a good scientist. I think so too. Yes, he was open-minded enough to sort of, to just be like, yeah. yeah, go for it. And you have your, you know, you can interpret the evidence that you have in this way. And and to be honest now, like, I still have no idea. Like, I have, I think we need more fossils in order to answer that question. So there, I can see arguments for both. Yeah. You know, for both. I have, but yeah, at the time I just, I was very adamant that <laughs> he was wrong and I was right. I love and that he answer. let me do it. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. No problem. And the last one, Tracy, I, I really have a bunch of um, big questions for you today. Mm -hmm. Are you ready? I'm ready. Cool. Are we still evolving? Oh, yes. <laughs> In which ways? <laughs> oh, are we still evolving? Okay, so I think, yes, we're still evolving because humans are animals just like anything else. And so we're subject to, um, yeah, the same evolutionary processes that fish and birds and insects <laughs> um but we obviously we we temper that with medicine and um and healthcare and all these different things that allow most individuals to have have successful offspring which wouldn't have happened in the past and i, th I thought about that when i gave birth to my own children and thought I would have died and they would have died <laughs> if I didn't have medical intervention and then i would have been yeah. erased from the evolutionary record um and so um Yes, yeah, so I think we're still evolving. Um, in what ways is a trickier, yeah, is a trickier question. Um, related to sort of one of the questions I had in my talk about, because it's, I'm interested in this internal bone structure, is um, I think we, we, you know, we know that recent humans have this more and more gracile skeleton that reflects the fact that we're just not as active as our as our ancestors were and I can see there's going to be some sort of threshold there because our bones are not just about the scaffolding of our bodies but they also produce our blood and it also is our reservoir for calcium and things like this but I think probably we are ev continuing to evolve a more gracile skeleton unless we decide to get more active <laughs> um but um yeah, or we're evolving to just erase ourselves off the planet. But that's a bit, you know, that's a bit of a downer, isn't it? <laughs> Could happen, though. I mean, <laughs> that's probably the more likely option. Maybe the Earth has had enough. Yeah. I'd understand. Okay, this is our last segment. Mm -hmm. We're doing a rapid fire round. Oh, okay. It's called the Hey Us Quick Dicks. Okay. Are you an introvert or an extrovert? Oh, introvert, for sure. Are you? Yes. I, I couldn't, I wouldn't have thought. Oh, really? Like, no. Oh, yeah, no, I thought, yeah. <laughs> I am, I am like, let's go home and spend some time by myself. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but you can be 
then apparently so from what i'm seeing you're very outgoing in conversations and your talk was so engaging and so you know full of energy so uh-huh. i don't know if that's the definition of an extrovert per yeah. se but it's funny so one of the things so it's interesting that you said so Um, one of the things I had to do when I was at University of Kent is they like to give you this leadership training um, to learn how to be a leader. And <laughs> some of it, most of it is just BS. But one of the <laughs> things they do is one of those psychology tests of your personality, which I'd never done before, um, which I think psychologists would also say is BS. But um, but I came out as truly introvert. And, and, they, and what was interesting is they said that introverts find the you um introverts find this sort of they can be capable of being extroverted but they find it exhausting ah uh, yeah and yeah. i've heard about that before yeah and so i do find like this is i'm you know obviously i'm very comfortable right now and it's fine but i will go home and be like i don't want to talk to anyone I don't, you know you need to recharge yeah whereas yeah, i think yeah. truly extroverted people just love the social interaction yes. yeah yeah so i'm definitely an that introvert. makes sense yeah mm-hmm. i like that Three words to describe yourself. You cannot use introvert anymore. Okay. <laughs> um, optimist. Uh, perseverance. And I would say, oh gosh. Oh, God, I've been pitched like my husband listening to this thing. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> um, And, uh, well, and I'd still say imposter syndrome. Like, that is alive and well, no matter how sort of high you get in the uh, in the sort of academic ladder. I think that's something that women need to sort of get over, but it's it's still there. So I think that's also something that I still I still struggle with. My God, Tracy, <laughs> if you say that. <laughs> but that I makes you, it. it makes you a better scientist. So it means, I think, so that's, I think, the upside of imposter syndrome is that you... You have this sort of fear that you're gonna, you know, like someone's gonna find out that I have no idea how to be a director of a department. <laughs> so I'm going to do extra work and I'm gonna prepare and I'm gonna read these papers and I'm gonna do all these things where I think people who don't have that just wing it and um, and they can wing it and sometimes it works, but sometimes it sometimes doesn't. Sometimes it works so well. It like does. they get the positions, <laughs> they apply for the positions that some women wouldn't mm-hmm. because they're like, I don't fulfill all like the the points. Yeah. But yeah, mm-hmm. I could that could be a whole that podcast be a, yeah. in itself, honestly. <laughs> I talked to Gregor Larson about that mm-hmm. and he told me the story. Like there is this one story where... Um, I think it was even a female scientist um, was talking to a guy at a conference and he was like, oh my God, I, I think I'm in the wrong place here. I don't know what I'm doing here. All these people are so sophisticated. Turns out it was Buzz Aldrin. No. <laughs> and he's been to the moon. He told me that story in the podcast. So really? he was like making the point of no imposter syndrome is everywhere. Yeah. And I was like, okay, at least I'm not the only one, but sometimes yeah. it could like come out as like, I'm doing more, I'm preparing myself more, Or in some people, I think it could also go the other direction where they're like taking themselves back. They don't want to speak during meetings and they're like, whatever I have to say is not as important or maybe not as correct as like that other person. Mm -hmm. And then, (sighs) yeah, there's definitely a negative side to it where you, it's that lack of confidence that you have that you're not willing to, yeah, to share your ideas. And then this is where the science is. No, it's, it's so complex and it's a, Mm -hmm. Yeah, a whole topic topic in itself. God, I could really speak to you for like the whole day, and then you're like, I'm exhausted. I need my bed. <laughs> I'm an introvert, Victoria. Remember that? No, <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> no, no, it's totally fine. So you were born in Richmond, BC. I was, yes. As you mentioned, you're Canadian. I personally love Canada. My dad loves it. Mm. Obsessed. He goes there as much as often as he can, like wants to move there, all of the above. I have a maple leaf tattooed, so we're really into it. Oh, wow. What do you miss most about it? What do I miss most? Or do you about miss it? <sighs> you know, it's so I haven't lived in Canada since 2009, And I go back quite, I don't go back very often because now we have two kids and it's a lot easier for my family to come to Germany or to come to the UK than it is for us, all four of us to get on a plane and go. Um, But when I go home, I 
there are two things that, well, one, I think, God, the roads and the cars and everything is so big <laughs> and yeah. wide and there's so much space. Parking lots. Yeah. <laughs> everything is, I was like, why is this? Well, bro, like you could put four roads in one road in the, you know, like, like a European. You have more space Yeah, we though. do have a lot more space. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I miss the most, apart from a uh, family is um I think it is the space like it's that so when we uh, went back recently and drove so I I I was born in BC but grew up mostly in Alberta and we do this we always did this drive through the Rocky Mountains between Alberta and BC and when I did that the last time I would just remembered how beautiful Canada is and particularly that I'm getting you know, goosebumps right now no it's I so did that drive with my dad it was <laughs> so unbelievable for me so beautiful and so calm it's like yeah yeah I remember asking my dad dad when people go grocery shopping here there's like one house and then there is nothing for two hours and there and then there might be a gas station or yeah. like a grocery <laughs> store what do they do if they forget their milk yeah yeah, you just don't like, forget it. Yeah. As a European, you just don't forget it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's why Otherwise, you have a big you drink car. black coffee. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but where are you from then originally? I'm Austrian. You're I'm Austrian. From okay. the southern part. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's a bit more um, mountainy, rocky than okay. here because it's very flat. But yeah. Austria is so tiny. It's so small. So it's like a two and a half hour drive okay. maximum. Yeah. So I can always go and see my family, which is oh, really lovely. That is Okay, and then the last, I promise you this was the last segment, but I was actually lying because okay. we have another one. Okay, no problem. <laughs> it's going to be a quick one. Yeah. We have a segment where we ask our guests to leave a question for one of the upcoming guests while not telling them who they're leaving it for okay. to remove any bias. Okay. And that question is so great because it fits to everything that we've been talking about. Mm. Have you ever thought of leaving academia? Yes. I did have. during my P PhD. Yeah. Um, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, because, well, it was fine. Because I just, I, you know, well, PhD is hard, as you, as you may realize, Victoria, if you're in the middle of it or at the end of it. Um, and particularly at the end, it can be really hard where you, you hate your project, you hate your supervisor, you hate everything, you know, you don't, I remember thinking, yourself, I never, <laughs> I never want to write the word knuckle walking ever again. I've <laughs> typed it so many times. Um, uh, but I just, I, yeah, early on in my PhD, I was sort of struggling to, I think, yeah, to sort of find exactly what I wanted to do and thinking, was I, you know, was I smart enough to do this? Was I able to do it? And I thought maybe I should be a, a teacher. And then I looked at like what you needed to do to qualify to be a teacher. And I realized I wasn't qualified to do anything else. <laughs> I was like, oh, I guess I better persevere with this PhD thing then. So because, it, yeah, I realized like I liked science, but I hadn't taken I have like grade 10 biology, you know, basically. And so I, I wasn't qualified to teach any of the or even enter teachers college yeah. to do any of these topics I was interested in. So I thought, OK, I'll just keep going. And I'm glad I did. And we're all glad you did. <laughs> Thank you. So to wrap this up, where can people find you online? Oh, I'm I'm one of these people who's very bad at social media. Um, so uh, I have there's a website with the <laughs> the Max Funk. There's for the department. I do have I do use Twitter or X or whatever it's called now, um, but very rarely post on it because it takes me about forty five minutes to figure out how to do it each time. Um, and I've recently gone on to Blue Sky. What is that? This is the new Twitter or something so that you can, you know, avoid all your ethical issues with Elon Musk, which I tried Should to. Should I know about that? But I also don't do Twitter that much. No, so. exactly. So, I, so I, I am on Twitter and then I am also on Blue Sky, but I don't know how to use Blue Sky. And I think I have two friends on Blue Sky. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm never on it. I don't, I've never used it. So um, Twitter, and then I'm like, you know, an old lady that still uses Facebook because my mom's on Facebook and then I can share photos of the kids on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I'm also on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, okay. So <laughs> what's wrong about that? That's where all the cool people are. Right? Know? Yeah. We're going to make it cool again. We are. Yes, it'll come around. <laughs> I'm sure. So is there anything you would like to add, promote, or put out there? Anything you feel like I didn't ask you today? Oh, 
no this has been like the most delightful conversation I've loved it um no I don't think so I think I think it's just been great thank you thank you for doing this I think these podcasts are really important and as we talked at the very beginning which was not on the microphones that I think it's our responsibility as scientists to share what we do with the public in a way that they can understand and get excited about so um so thank you for doing this Tracy, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Oh, you're very welcome. Anytime. Hello again, Victoria here. If you enjoyed this episode or the podcast in general, please consider showing us your support by liking, sharing, and subscribing to our podcast on Spotify and YouTube. Your feedback and engagement mean the world to us and keep us going. Thank you for joining us on this journey and stay tuned for the next episode of the Hayas Podcast.